Hello, AP Biologist. Mrs. Greider here to talk about population growth, also known as Chapter 53 in your assignments for this summer. I'm only going to make a video for Chapter 53 because I feel like 54 is a lot more straightforward and I've had some technical difficulties. I apologize about that. Um, if you have questions about 54, please feel free to contact me. So, 53, population growth. What's it about? So, the first thing we need to talk about is what is a population? And a population is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same general area. Now, I've got two pictures here. Which one of them fits the definition of a population? I've got a group of otters living in the ocean, and I've got a bunch of different types of fish and coral living together at a coral reef. If you guess the otters, you are correct. So the otters are defined as a population because they're one single species, one type of animal or plant that is living together in an area. In contrast, the coral reef has lots of different species of fish. I can tell because there's different patterns on them, different types of coral. So this is what we would call a community, lots of different species living together. That's chapter 54. But in chapter 53, we're just talking about groups of a single species. So one species living together. So the otters are a population. Keep that in mind as we talk about the next few things main question that chapter 53 is seeking to address for our purposes is why do populations change in size? Remember that populations are made of living things. So living things die, they're born, they move around. And so because of that, populations are not static. Static means that something remains exactly the same over time. Populations aren't like that because they're made of living things. So we instead we say they fluctuate. Fluctuating means going up and down. Not being totally constant, but going kind of up and down. And so you can see in this green circle part of the graph that this population, even though it's remaining around the carrying capacity, around a certain level, it's fluctuating. It's not just at one point. So as we seek to find out why are populations changing in size, why are they increasing, decreasing, fluctuating, we have to think about these four factors. So one factor is births, new babies being born, and other, another is immigration, new organisms moving in. Both of those will increase the size of a population. On the other side, we have deaths and emigration. Emigration is moving away, and so deaths and emigration can decrease the size of a population. When we add those factors together, we get whether the population is growing or decreasing. For background information, there are a couple of rates that are discussed in your homework and in this section of the book. And these rates, there's three of them. One of them is the death rate or mortality rate. This comes up a lot in your, um, in your packet for your homework. And the death rate is also known as the mortality rate. And mortality simply means death or dying. And the death rate is calculated by how many offspring die for every certain number of organisms. So for example, three out of every 100,000 people die is a death rate. And you can calculate that as a percentage as well. The number that die divided by the total number times 100 is the formula for that. You can also calculate a birth rate on the other end for how many organisms are born for every X number of organisms. So five births for every thousand water buffalo. That's an example of that. And you can also calculate that as a percent. The last one that we're going to talk about is the growth rate. So the growth rate is what's going on overall in the population. Is it the overall increase or decrease in a population over time? So you can calculate a birth, um, a simple growth rate just by saying what is the birth rate minus the death rate. That will tell you overall what's happening, how many are added versus how many leave. Or you can find it as the slope on a graph of a population over time. So this is going to come in handy for us when we talk about the two types of population growth that we see um, in populations. The first one is known as exponential population growth. And that's population growth with unlimited resources and ideal factors. So let's look at what the growth rate looks like in an exponential population growth situation. Here's a graph of a number of cranes, which are this bird right here, increasing over time in an exponential pattern. So in exponential growth, the growth rate is positive. That means that the slope is pointing upward and the growth rate actually increases over time. So that means that the growth rate, the increases are getting bigger every single year. So what that means is that the change from 1940 to 1960 
you can see it's positive. It's, it's going up a little bit, but it's not a very steep slope. It's not increasing by that much. In contrast, from 1960 to 1980, we see a much bigger increase in the number of cranes. So that's a more positive, more steep slope. And then from 1980 to the year 2000, we can see that overall the slope has gotten bigger even more. It's an even steeper increase. So in exponential growth situations, the slope will always be positive and we will see an increasingly steep slope over time. Um, when I talk about slope, I am talking about the same slope that you've been calculating in your algebra and math classes. And I'm calculating it the same way that you've calculated it, um, which is to say y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So for example, in 1940, there's about 40 cranes in 1960, about 30 cranes in 1940. And if I calculate that out, that means 0.5 cranes per year is the growth rate. Now you might be thinking, Mrs. Grider, you can't give birth to half of a crane during the year. And I would say you are exactly right. And that is because this number one is telling me about over a course of 20 years, what happened? And you can see that even from um, 1940 to 1960, we see some fluctuation. And also you have to remember that this number, the growth rate, is the total, or what we would call the net look, <coughs> excuse me, in, at the population, which includes births and deaths. So it's not just that 0.5 cranes were born in a year, it's that some number of cranes was born, some number of cranes died, and when you average all of that together, we see that it was about half a crane a year on average added to the population. So over the course of those 20 years, it was about 10 cranes. Similarly, I can calculate the growth rate from 1960 to 1980 same way that I did it. And I will also see that I have a positive increase, about 1.75, so almost two cranes per year when you balance out the births and the deaths. And I can see that that number is larger than the 0.5 cranes per year. So that means my steep got sloper, it's increasing even faster because we're adding more cranes per year. Now, once again, exponential population growth happens with unlimited resources and ideal factors. The factors that I'm talking about are the resources and things that that organism needs to survive. We categorize these into two groups. The first group is biotic factors. Biotic means living, like biology is the study of life. Biotic are living factors. And living things can be plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, all of those things that an organism might need to eat or have a mutualistic relationship with. That's something from chapter 54 that it might need to survive. There's also abiotic or non-living factors. A, the prefix A means no or not, and bio means life. So abiotic, non-living. And abiotic factors are things like space to live in, water, soil, weather, air, non-living things that an organism really needs to survive. So in an exponential situation, those things are unlimited. They are perfect conditions for it to live in, and it's just going to increase and increase and increase. In contrast, we have logistic population growth, and that's population growth when there are limited resources. So this is the majority of the situations that we'll see because most organisms are not living in a place with basically unlimited resources. And that is going to reach a carrying capacity for the environment they live in. You can see the carrying capacity marked right here. Um, and that's kind of the limit, the upper limit on how many organisms this population and environment can support. And we can see that the growth rate first increases. You can see the slope is getting steeper. It's going up faster and faster. And then it decreases. It kind of levels out. And those slopes, it's still increasing, but it's not increasing nearly as fast. And in this, it's reaching the carrying capacity, which acts as kind of what we call a set point. So that means that the population will come back to this level as long as the resources remain the same. And this concept is called feedback regulation, that it will, if it increases, it'll bring it back to the carrying capacity. If it decreases, it'll bring it back to the carrying capacity. So all of this population is going to end up around that level because that, those are the resources that this environment has to support a population. So the next question is, what keeps the population around the carrying capacity? So what is keeping it at that level and not letting it increase or decrease too far around that? And those are density dependent and density independent regulations. So density dependent depends on how many organisms there are in that area. It will act more if there are more organisms, less if there are less organisms is usually what we're talking about. And density independent regulation, which does not depend on how many organisms there are in that area. Let's dive into that a little bit more deeply. So in density 
independent factors. This will change the birth rate or the death rate. So it will change how our population grows. It does not matter how many organisms there are in the area. It will always affect them in the same way. So if I look at these two lines, this is a graph of population density versus the intensity of the factor on population growth. So a density independent factor does not depend, it does not change with population density. So it is this blue line right here that is straight across. This is saying whether your population density is low, there are not very many organisms in a certain space, or whether it is high, there are tons of organisms in a certain space, it is going to affect it about the same. These factors tend to be abiotic. I'm going to give this a caveat or a warning. Not all abiotic factors are density independent, but many of them are. And those are things like weather, climate, soil and water quality, pesticides. This means that if the water quality is terrible, it's probably going to kill a lot of organisms, whether you have two fish living in the lake or 100,000 fish living in the lake. If the water quality is bad, it's probably going to kill a lot of fish. The same way if um, with, um, sorry, with pesticides being sprayed. And this is an example that comes up in your homework that there's some pesticides that they just kill a lot of insects. And so whether it is two insects or 100 insects, it's going to kill the same amount every single time. In contrast to that, we have density dependent factors. And this changes the birth or death rate to bring it back to that carrying capacity. And the more organisms there are in the area, the more this is going to affect them. So you can see this is the red line. You can see that at a low population density, it's not having a very big effect. And at a high population density, it's having a really large effect. These factors are both biotic and abiotic, but mostly biotic factors. These include intraspecific competition. This is competition with other members of your same species for food, territory, and other resources. Predation. So um, if there's a lot of a certain type of organism around, they're more likely to be eaten because there's more of them. Um, toxic wastes. So many organisms um, in your book, the example is mushrooms and bacteria um, tend to excrete or let out toxins as a byproduct of their metabolism as they break down food. And that will kind of cause other things to move away from them because they'll be killed by the toxin. Um, and then intrinsic physiological factors. Physiology is the body or the um, insides of the organisms and how it's operating. And there are some intrinsic factors where when you have a lot of a certain animal in the same place, they just won't reproduce as quickly. It has to do with their hormones and its regulation from those factors. So basically, density-dependent factors are the, the factors that are bringing it back to this carrying capacity. If it gets too high up here, um, the density-dependent factors will bring it back to right around that carrying capacity. In contrast, the density independent factors will just have a giant effect and might drop it way below the carrying capacity um, because it doesn't depend on how many there are. It's going to affect them all basically the same way. Um, this bringing it back to the carrying capacity is that feedback regulation. Um, if it gets too high, it's going to be brought back down. That's all I have to say about chapter 53. If you have additional questions, please make sure that you go through your homework and take the quiz. The quiz can help answer some of your questions too, or you can also send me an email or contact me. I'll see you soon. Thanks.